Yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really, really pleased and honored to participate. As it happens, my, uh, uh, my colleagues, the co-panelists here, I just met them earlier this afternoon, and it turns out we all, one way or another, we all work for the VA, so we decided to call ourselves Team VA. <laughs> so I will introduce, I will introduce the three speakers in order, and then afterwards, I have a very, very brief presentation on the Community Resource and Referral Center that uh, I do uh, head in Washington, D.C. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Anne Elizabeth Montgomery. She's an investigator at the VA National Center on Homelessness Amongst Veterans. Um, her research focus in, uh, is on homelessness prevention, permanent supportive housing, and trans transformation of hot bash for those of you who don't know, you will hear about it, to uh, housing first approach, and thirdly, evaluation of homelessness programs. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Anna Elizabeth Montgomery. I'm a researcher with the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans. And today I'm going to talk about um, the development of an assessment to identify veterans who are at imminent risk of homelessness or who have recently experienced homelessness. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the development um, and sort of tell you where it's ended up. Um, VA now has um, essentially a universal um, screener for homelessness risk, which we think is the first healthcare system to do that. Um, so we're pretty excited about this project. So um, at one point in time in January 2011, there were um, over 67,000 veterans who are experiencing homelessness in the United States. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, that's about 12% of the homeless population. We found the veterans are overrepresented among the homeless population, and there's been a huge initiative by the VA um, to prevent and end homelessness among veterans in five years. Um, we're several years into that goal, uh, and we're working really hard, on the, and the VA has um, responded with lots and lots of resources. Um, specifically, um, to date, the VA has already allocated to community-based um, homelessness prevention services providers $150 million to identify veterans who are at imminent risk of homelessness or have recently experienced homelessness um, and to prevent or end that episode of homelessness. Um, but we um, needed a tool to identify who those veterans were who were at imminent risk. Um, a lot of veterans will um, present for homeless services, but a lot, a lot won't. Um, so we um, have worked for the past couple years to come up with a tool to do this. Um, as all of y'all are aware, um, prevention in general and homelessness prevention specifically is very difficult. It's difficult to provide prevention services efficiently. Um, so this is, you know, our, our attempt at doing that. Um, so the tool had a, has several objectives. Uh, the first is to identify veterans who are at risk of homelessness. Um, the second is to ensure that they're referred appropriately, um, either within the VA system or outside of the VA system, um, and to um, for them to have further assessments and that they're given um, the right program for their needs rather than um, you know, a space in the program that happens to be available at that time. And then to inform guidelines for level of care. Um, our, our hope is that <coughs> veterans who, who need assistance to prevent their episode of homelessness sort of get as little help as they need to end that episode. Um, it's an expensive and, as I said, um, often inefficient enterprise. So um, we're trying really hard to refine um, how that happens. So um, what we did at the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans was um, first to develop a two-stage instrument. Um, we worked with, uh, we, or we looked toward the research, we looked toward um, a homelessness prevention programs throughout the country that had been successful in identifying um, households that were at risk of homelessness. And um, we looked toward um, subject matter experts on this issue. And we came up with two broad questions. One, um, asking about 
a veteran's um, recent experience of housing instability um, and whether the veteran has concerns that he or she um, will experience housing instability in the, in the coming days. Um, so that sort of stage one of this assessment sort of determined whether or not we got a little bit more information from the veteran um, in the second stage, which looked at um, risk factors for homelessness, including um, recent homelessness, frequency of moves, um, poor credit or rental history, um, recent life changes, changes in employment, income, benefits, um, or if the veteran felt like he or she needed assistance to um, find housing or, or other services. Um, and so what we did um, once we developed that <coughs> instrument was we um, spoke with a number of homeless veterans and made sure that um, the phrasing was appropriate, that um, we, what we thought we were asking in a question, the veteran thought we were asking in a question. Um, and this sort of goes back to some comments that have been made today that it's um, you know, there's people sitting at a desk and there's people who are experiencing homelessness and we um, wanted to make sure that this really spoke to the population we were trying to reach. Um, we pilot tested the full instrument with both stages uh, at four VA medical centers among about 380 veterans. Um, and we were fortunate that these medical centers were located in both urban and rural areas. Um, the instrument was piloted in a variety of clinic settings, so urgent care, primary care, um, OEF, OIF, which are the clinics for um, veterans of their, our recent conflicts, um, and veterans of um, sort of a diverse group of veterans in terms of age, gender, race, um, responding to the, to the tool. So once we got that data, um, we did some psychometric analyses to figure out how good the scale was um, in terms of, um, you know, did, were the veterans responses correlated with each other? Did they, um, did those risk factors really sort of predict whether a veteran um, self-endorsed being um, at risk of homelessness or experiencing some housing instability? Um, and so we use those findings to sort of refine the instrument. Um, this slide just kind of um, shows you um, the difference in characteristics between those who screened positive for homelessness risk and those who did not. Um, in our screen, about 33% did screen positive, which is a very, very, very high rate. And homelessness is a rare event. You would never ex expect from a sort of random population for it to be 33%. Um, but the way that we did the pilot, it was social workers who were asked to interview 100 veterans. Um, so this is a little um, skewed. Um, we do have um, findings from our clinical reminder that the rate that we're getting, and this is among 100,000 100, veterans, is about 2%, which is a little closer to, to what we expected. Um, but the participants who participated in this pilot were, um, there were a couple of differences across um, sort of whether they were at risk of homelessness or not. Um, those who were at risk of homelessness were um, less likely to be married, um, which is pretty common. Um, they were um, a little bit, it kind of seems a little bit younger. Um, they were more from um, the recent conflicts in terms of their military service era. Um, they were Medicaid eligible, which means um, that they were in the lowest income priority group at the VA. Um, and they were, it seemed kind of slightly less likely to have a service-connected disability because that provides um, quite a significant source of income for veterans. Regarding the psychometrics, um, we found that in terms of internal consistency, reliability, we had a, a good um, scale. Um, in terms of criterion validity, what we looked at is we ran logistic regressions that gave us an idea of the likelihood that if a veteran responded positively to certain risk factors, he or she would also have responded as being at risk of homelessness. So 
for example, veterans who reported that they were homeless at least one night in the past 30 days were 3.2 times more likely um, or as likely to um, report, report risk of homelessness. Um, so you can see, based on these odd ratios, which factors were really, really strongly tied um, with the veteran's endorsement of homelessness risk. Um, if a veteran reported that he or she needed help to get or keep housing, they, they were 26 times as likely to have reported risk of homelessness. Um, so we found some really strong associations between the risk factors um, and the actual outcome of, of risk itself. Um, and the final psychometric analysis we did was to look at the construct validity, um, which basic, basically showed us that um, this scale was essentially measuring one construct. It wasn't measuring homelessness risk and food insecurity, um, or homelessness risk and can't think of another example, but <laughs> it was basically measuring homelessness risk. Um, so we were really excited um, with those findings. Um, the next thing that we did um, was to come up with a homelessness risk severity as sort of a yardstick by which um, clinicians could identify um, sort of the level of intensity of services that a veteran may need to remediate their homelessness risk or experience of homelessness. Um, and so what we did for each of these, um, in this table, for each of these risk factors, we assigned um, weights that sort of indicated severity of, um, sort of, a, not severity of their homelessness, but how strongly um, that risk factor was related to, to their homelessness risk. So, um, again, those who, if you report that you need help to get or keep housing, that's a pretty high, high level of need. Um, but then, on the other hand, we found that, you know, if you had changed employment or income, we assigned that a one. Um, we did that with a, a panel of, of experts um, who were really familiar and worked a long time um, with homelessness and homelessness prevention. Um, we haven't tested this sort of rubric um, or this kind of um, scale to be able to assign intensity of services, but it's sort of it's something we could test. Um, we're working on several other instruments at the National Center um, to ask questions of veterans to figure out really what level of services and what type of services they need. Um, the findings here do kind of show that something that we do believe is that the minority of individuals or households who are at risk of homelessness um, need the most intensive services. Um, most veterans and most households um, can be served with sort of a lighter touch intervention and likely um, not experience homelessness. So um, what this has sort of evolved into, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, is a national clinical reminder through the VA Medical Center, um, or medical centers throughout the country. It's a, it's a national um, effort, and it's a very brief, um, at most three question screener that's administered to all veterans who present for outpatient um, uh, care, and also emergency departments, but that's a little more iffy, but it's primarily um, outpatient primary care, um, so if a veteran just shows up um, for an appointment, they are asked um, they are asked these questions. Um, for the past 60 days, have you been living in stable housing that you own, rent, or stay in as part of the household? Um, if they say yes, then they are asked the next question, um, which is about the next 60 days, if they're concerned about uh, where they'll stay in the next 60 days. Um, if there's no concerns about recent or future, um, the veteran's not asked the questions again for another year. Um, if there are concerns, the veteran is um, referred to either homeless services or um, social work services. The veteran can opt out of the screener. The veteran can opt out of a referral. Um, but this is really, the goal of this is to identify veterans who we would otherwise not identify, and as I mentioned, we found that among 
the um, many thousands of people who've been screened in the last couple weeks, this clinical reminder just came out about two weeks ago, about 2% uh, have, are positive for homelessness. There's been another um, group of veterans who are receiving homeless services within the community, but were not known by the VA as, as being homeless. Um, so that's important. Um, piece that we're learning and that sort of plays into some of the other research that we're doing using community mainstream homeless data and VA homeless data to see how veterans um, sort of go within and among um, different homeless services systems. And then now I'll introduce Dr. Jameson Fargo who's also an investigator at the VA National Center for Homelessness amongst veterans. He's an associate professor of social epidemiology and psychology at Utah State University. His research interests include risk factors for homelessness at the individual and the community level. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, thanks to the organizers and uh, the other participants. It's been a wonderful forum thus far. Um, I want to also, let's see. before I get started, I also wanted to acknowledge some of our uh, my colleagues on this work, um, Dr. Ellen Munley and then Tom and Anne Elizabeth who are here. Vince Kane, who's the director of the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans, and Dr. Dennis Colhane, who is the director of research uh, for the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the center or not, but it's based in Philadelphia with some satellite locations. The Philadelphia site is primarily focused on uh, research. There's a site in Tampa, which is, is also a large uh, portion of the center, mostly focused on uh, program and model development. Um, the title of my talk today is Modeling Geographic Variation in Rates of Single Adults and Families Experiencing Homelessness as a function of community characteristics. So what does that have to do with veterans? Nothing. <laughs> we don't, we, <laughs> there are a number of us in our, in our group who have other um, appointments, and so I only give a portion of my time to the VA. However, this research was conducted under the auspices of the VA. Um, we, we conducted a large study, and this is just a portion of that study, where we were interested in looking at um, community factors that co-varied with rates of homelessness nationally. And so we also looked at a number of uh, veteran um, rates of homelessness. Um, however, the, the veteran rate and the single adult rate sort of traveled together in, in most of our findings. And so it's always nice to have a contrast group. So I decided to present uh, research today comparing single adults and families. Um, uh, I, a few people have alluded to the uh, most recent um, point in time uh, report and from that report we learned that most of the homeless individuals uh, from the point in time <coughs> count were single adults, um, about two thirds and the other third are, are families. And, and so these groups represent a large proportion of the, of the total homeless population um, in addition to, to youth. <coughs> Um, both of these groups possess unique risk factors as well as pathways into and through the experience of homelessness. And so just by way of background, I, I put together this table which sort of shows um, family homeless, uh, hom homeless families, excuse me, on the, the, the upper row here and homeless singles on the lower, and then a reference for some of these data. But um, homeless families are, are for the large part uh, female. Uh, non-white, younger, um, very small proportion of veterans, uh, a lower uh, rate of mental illness and substance abuse as compared to, to single adults. Uh, the shelter stay tends to be longer and typically they're more likely to be transitional or episodic as compared to chronic and less likely to have an incarceration history. <coughs> so although there's some differences identified in these types of families uh, experiencing homelessness, it's unclear as to what extent these contrasts indicate that different causal factors contribute to family and single adult homelessness. And um, so we continue to have these gaps in our knowledge um, in terms of causal factors, despite improved data collection and better data. 
Um, there are, have been several multi-dimensional models that have been developed, um, but typically those studies include all household types lumped together um, as one rate, rate of homelessness, and they're not breaking the um, groups out into whether they belong to a, a family or not. Um, and so these studies have found that uh, many uh, structural factors, community factors, are important in terms of understanding rates of homelessness. Again, we don't have it broken out by uh, singles and, and family uh, units. And some of the studies that have been done have been limited to a, a single state or, or to just individual level observations, not so much community factors. So our study um, that I'm presenting today, um, we're applying that approach, multi-dimensional approach, to new data on homelessness rates, uh, distinguishing between rates for families and single adults. And we're also going to be looking at rates in metropolitan and non-metropolitan uh, regions. And so we're, we're including a nationwide sample from all continuum of care. And so the real goal behind all this work um, is to try and identify modifiable community factors, uh, as well as protective factors, that we can um, perhaps uh, work with to uh, prevent and reduce uh, different types of homelessness. So uh, in conducting this study, our, our outcomes, our dependent variables, if you will, were homeless rates from the 2009 point in time count. We looked at um, a few different rates. We looked at homeless, the rate of homeless families per 10,000 families as well as homeless families per 10,000 families in poverty. And then we did the same thing for singles, so we had four different outcomes. And we had to transform the data to fit the assumptions of the models that we used. Um, in terms of the community level predictors, we obtained data from several, um, they were all publicly available data sources. Um, American Community Surveys from the CDC, some of their national uh, surveillance um, surveys, HUD data as well as a few other sources. And most of these data were available at the state or county level. We, um, the PIT data, of course, are at the COC level. And so we had to come up with a way of um, putting data in terms of the same unit of analysis. So we basically aggregated our um, county data up to the COC level by coming up with pooled estimates depending on the nature of the data. So we had COC level and state level data. So the COC is nested within states, so we use some multi-level <coughs> models um, to um, basically try to account for variation in homeless rates based on the um, community predictors that we included in our models. We, we had a lot of variables. Um, we had over 500 community level variables after we did this work uh, that we were looking at and um, sort of whittled those down um, to what we deemed modifiable variables. Uh, we also conducted our model separately for each um, what we called uh, community domain. Uh, we broke it out into behavioral demographic uh, factors, economic factors, and safety net factors. We also stratified on um, size of the, of the COC, metropolitan or non-metropolitan. So here's some of our results. Um, again, we have the four outcomes, and then by metropolitan or non-metropolitan areas. So there are 274 metropolitan COCs and 149. Um, these are, again, the numbers of homeless families per 10,000 families, and then 10,000 families in poverty, and then for singles. Um, and then we have, the, we have means and we have rates um, for each. So looking at um, demographic and behavioral factors, I apologize for this being so small, but the bold uh, essentially indicates a significant um, community predictor variable. And so we had variables, for instance, on alcohol consumption, drug use, and, uh, d dependency and use, liquor store density, um, uh, the percent of pregnancies with no care in the first trimester, uh, percent of births out of wedlock, uh, percent of individuals with no social support, homicide rate, and car thefts turned out to be our, our significant uh, factors in the metropolitan uh, COCs. In the non-metropolitan models, we had things like average life expectancy, 
hospital shortage area, so it kind of ties into some of the themes from earlier today, uh, healthcare access, um, percent of births out of wedlock, car thefts, and percent of uh, religious adherence. And these models account for a <coughs> large proportion of the variance in the um, outcome variables, um, especially when we control for poverty. Um, we have, for instance, almost 50% of the variance accounted for um, among uh, homeless um, single adults. And then our economic factors, um, I'm not, I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'm not going to go through each of these individually, but most of our, um, a lot of these economic factors were significantly related to uh, homelessness, uh, property values, housing, adequacy, income, um, charitable giving in a, in a region. And then our safety <coughs> factors, we have fewer of these. Um, we still ca account for quite a bit of variance in our outcomes. Um, households receiving SSI, um, uh, subsidized units, Medicaid spending as per <coughs> percent of total state expenditures, nonprofit agencies per capita, TANF expenditures, and so on. So, th and there, there were some differences among families and singles. So, for instance, among families, uh, economic factors accounted for the most variance, uh, reaching 50%, but really only for metropolitan areas while other factors only account for about 20 to 30 percent of variance. So there's still a lot of factors that we weren't really modeling that account for a large part of the variation in homelessness rates across the country for families. The unique factors um, were along the lines of alcohol consumption, uh, liquor store density, life expectancy, first time with mothers again, religious adherence, adequacy of housing, um, discretionary income, charitable giving, employment rate, rent to income ratio and percent rentals. Whereas for homeless singles, um, each of the domains really kind of played a big role in accounting for variation across the country, um, and, and re as well as regardless of whether it was metropolitan or non-metropolitan. And then I list the unique factors there, such as drug use and dependence, uh, you know, criminology, hospital shortage area, and then some of the more economic value uh, variables. <coughs> So just sort of kind of pull, you know, the main themes from the from the data. The family homelessness rates were somewhat more related to public health and housing adequacy factors, whereas the single adult homelessness rates were more related to criminal, economic, and safety net adequacy factors. Um, we identified fewer factors um, correlating with uh, homelessness rates in non-metropolitan areas, suggesting more research might be needed there. Um, again, this is not a cause. This is not a cause and effect thing. We're not saying like if you shut down all the liquor stores, then family homelessness is going to just disappear overnight. This, these are just correlates, and so these could be proxies for other things, of course. Um, so there, they may be indicators of social phenomena that are closely tied to experiences of homelessness. And you know, we think that you know, looking at these two homeless subpopulations in different models or different ways. Um, allows us to develop more precise and informative models of homelessness. And so, you know, these sorts of characteristics might serve as targets for interventions that um, um, might help to reduce homelessness in the subpopulations. So, um, and then just as a limitation, this is just looking at community level factors, of course. These are not individual level or household level factors. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay, as I will ask my co-panelists to please step uh, up here so we can uh, feel any questions. In the meanwhile, I would like to just take a brief moment to go over a few slides. I think what you saw now is, or you will be seeing with this one here is, a nice summary of the VA, what the VA has been doing. On one hand, we are doing the research, we are creating the tools to assess, we are developing models, we are trying to understand what is it, what are the characteristics that we see that are shared, and, and what are the types of interventions that would be important or meaningful or useful versus those that are not. What I will be presenting to you is one of those 
uh, projects that were started last year. It's actually a pilot project. It's called the CRRC, the Community Resource and, Resource and Referral Center. Uh, there, are, there were supposedly 14 centers. The, the number has been increased to 17. As of this moment, there are only five that are operational. Ours, the one here in DC, the one that I have, is the only one that is open 24-7. <coughs> and uh, it's a concept that we're interested in to provide to, to help our veterans, not those who are homeless, but as mentioned earlier, those who are at risk for homelessness. So the, the end homelessness drive that started ten in 2010, the initiative was to eliminate veteran homelessness that is built really on six uh, strategies, outreach, prevention, treatment, housing, income, and uh, community participation. And the last one is really very important. So our goals, and, and I am looking at this here, I'll present it, I'm a physician by training. I know Dr., uh, I'm sorry, I think it is uh, John Lozier. You presented this idea, but from a systems perspective at the beginning. I'm presenting this from the individual perspective. As a veteran, as anybody at that matter, our goal is to break this cycle of unemployment leading to lack of income, leading to homelessness, substance abuse, and depression, later complicated by trauma. Now, remember, in the case of veterans, trauma might not necessarily be later, might be there when they come to us as veterans medical complications of that, and then leading into legal problems, and it's just a vicious cycle that keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So the goal of the CRRC is really to intervene at each and every one of these levels and help turn the tide and, and move our veterans out of this uh, vicious cycle. The facility that I'm referring to here, we are located on Franklin Street. It's really Rhode Island and 15th Northeast, not Northwest. So we're about a mile and a half from the medical center. Uh, our facility is about 13,000 square feet of usable space. We have offices for our staff, but also for our community partners. We provide interested parties who are willing or interested in taking time to provide the services that we do not provide to have office. We have five offices that are fully equipped, including internet access, that we provide. Just they need to commit for a time frame so you can take half a day every other week to a full day every week or to two half days or whatever agreement. We have five of these offices. We have a schedule, a rotating schedule that uh, they work with us on. We, we have conference rooms. We have a computer lab, a teaching kitchen, primary care clinic. We have a full-fledged three exam room, fully equipped uh, primary care clinic with a primary care physician, a physician assistant, and, and a nurse, and a health tech. We have a psychiatric clinic. We have an addiction program. We have housing services, that's the HCHV that was mentioned earlier, and we have the compensation work therapy that's part of our vocational, educational, employment services. Uh, we opened in April of this year, April 30th. So our data for the center was a little limited in, in, in May, so I don't have the, the, the data included here. But essentially, if you look at the number of uniques, that's the unique individuals who have come usually more than one time. If you look at the number of visits, we have 1,500 for 880 uniques. So that means on average, each veteran came about twice, slightly less than twice within that month. That's the unique for the month, not for the total period. But you can see how our numbers went up in a span of five months, 880, 1064, 1190, Eight, for some reason, September we had a dip, and now in October 1307. So the numbers are really going up. We suspect, although that does not explain September, that as the weather gets colder, we're going to have an even larger turn, turn, uh, uh, turnout at, at the center. I want to emphasize again, we are not a shelter. We are not a soup kitchen. We are a resource and referral center. We provide a multitude of services, not just uh, the, the, the services that I said to you, mentioned to you earlier. But we also provide some concrete services like emergency food, a meal, a hot meal for somebody who's hungry. We have showers. We have separate women's showers from men's showers. We have a play area for children. That's a reflection of the changing demographics. 
in the VA population. We have washer dryer or a room, I mean multiple washers and dryers. As I said, we have a computer lab that's open for our veterans to not only to take classes in, but also to use to check in their mail, to sign up for what we refer to in the VA as secure messaging, so they can read their medical results, communicate with their doctors, make appointments, and, and so on. And when it comes to housing, I think that the VA was one of the later organizations to finally uh, uh, accept and adapt the, the housing first model, which has really made a, a big difference. We are still in a transition, as uh, was mentioned earlier by Anne Elizabeth, or oh, the first center preparing, guiding us in this. We're going to transition into that. There's a lot of training that's going on now. I don't know where the number is, but we have 140 transitional beds. That's the that's the GPD grants per diem that was mentioned earlier. And then we have the, the hot vest, the Section 8 housing that comes with case management provided by us. So you can see a, a total number here of the beds that we have had from 2008 until this year. Now remember, these vouchers we got in May. So this is what we have been able to house in the last six months, 142 out of 210. Our cumulative rate, as you can see, is about 91%. And the uh, cumulative the house is 97, and the reason for that is some people drop out and then we reuse the voucher for another veteran. That's why you have a, a higher number. So that's really my brief uh, introduction to what the CRRC is doing. We are obviously, we have a, none of us, the 14 centers or 17 to be, have finished a year yet. The first one opened in March, and we opened in April. So we, would, we are constantly evaluating, re-evaluating, looking at the numbers, looking. Some of the data that we're very interested in looking at, and I, for those of you who work in the field, and particularly the healthcare end of things, and that's not a surprise, is that, and that's not a VA number, that's not a Washington number, this is a number that's national across all healthcare facilities. About one third of emergency department visits are attributed to social reasons. That is a big problem. It's extremely expensive, as you can imagine, to go to an emergency department because you're hungry than to go to a site that can provide you with food and then assist you in, how, in finding a place to live at, developing skills, to find a job, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the variables that we'll be interested in, outcomes that we're looking, interested in looking at over time, if we are going to make a difference in the emergency room utilization at the VA or not. We'll see, and I will be reporting to you later on this. So...